I stand here today very embarrassed as a South African to the, to the extent, by the extent to which our beloved country has been globally degraded, that you expect me to address you with, you must expect me to address you with candor, honesty about what has been happening in recent years. You are expecting me to speak candidly, amongst others, about the capture of our state and by implication our nation by a family that has corrupted our politicians on a level never seen before. The tsunami of scandals coming out of emails is only the beginning and the tip of the iceberg. I'm privileged to address you, Honoring Oliver Tambo, a great leader that was both relevant in his own time and now his own time where we are certainly lacking decisive leadership. It is a significant moment in the life of our people at a time when we have to choose new leaders that will have to heal our nation, and grow our economy, and also take ourselves forward. South Africa needs space to move on. It's a proud nation with a liberation movement of heroes and heroines and leaders who sacrificed so much for our freedom, we've experienced humiliation. Firstly, about our principles and our resolve to adhere to the morality of human rights and justice, as well as the strength of our economic resolve, downgraded. And if we allow a third downgrading to happen, which can happen very easily, arising from the public protectors' unexplained mistakes. Well, we'll have a third grading is at the door, and prof, it will affect the whole SADC. It won't only be South Africa. So we've got to be careful what we do here, because the rippling effect, as an economist, you understand, will be beyond our boundaries. The impact of the downgraded cannot be more visible than the fact that our economy has failed to respond positively, real growth during the past two quarters, placing our economic prospects in a drive, dive down recession. Everybody accepts this. Those that fail us don't need to look too hard to observe that we are visibly experiencing the disadvantages of having a junk credit rating, excluding our sovereign and company bonds from being bought by investors at reasonable rates. Deputy Minister, we are being raided by stronger currencies, depriving our economy from much needed investment capital, endangers the capacity of this economy to grow and support our political freedom. I also did not come here, ladies and gentlemen, to tell you things that you already know. I certainly don't want to dwell on weak leadership and corrupt. I really don't want to help dig a hole that is already filled with the voiceless victims of our government, so some of the gangsters from overseas. South Africa is a proud nation. We are a proud people and we love our country. One that has endured a past filled with peril and oppression. We are a nation that will stand up, stand together, revive our beliefs and work together to prosper together. When the, land, the, the world had written us off, we rose like phoenixes in 1994, and here we are. Thanks to the leadership of President Mandela and others. We have done it before under apartheid, and we can do it again. But firstly, we must get together as South Africans, like those before us that stood up in the face of adversity to draft, socialize, and approve the Freedom Charter in 1955, which gave birth to our Constitution as a guide, guiding principle. The March Acclaimed Freedom Charter endured more than 60 years of being a beacon of hope to all of South Africa, black and white, a document that fundamentally formed the base from which the Reconstruction and Development Program of 1994 and other development guidelines have been born. It, is also formed, it also formed the very basis 
as a much more detailed and modernized version of the highly contested National Development Plan for 2030, the NDP, adopted by government during 2012. Prof, I told my deputy minister in the presidency that you said this NDP to be national, he must sell it to the EFF. He was not there when you mentioned that point because he's very close to the EFF. So <laughs> <laughs> they were cooked in the same pot but served in different plates. Since we first got together with government and its representatives to examine and discuss the NDP in 2015, and thereafter with mostly private sector participants in 2016, I welcome integrated discussions that we are having at this summit. It tells me both government and the private sector are serious about finding a way to implement this valuable plan. But the government and private sector must come closer and closer every day and work together. We are a team, and we will win if we work together. We cannot be seen as this, them, and us. We all belong to one economy, one country, one flag, one national anthem. That's what we are, and we should work together. However, what happens when we leave this summit? Do we continue with our actions and activities as before? Or do we sit down with our peers, leaders, and those in power? Do we look critically at how we allocate our resources carefully, plan our actions and activities to ensure that we can fund and implement objectives of the NDP? But I have concern, if you look at the Auditor General's report yesterday, if 70 billion is just going to maladministration and all those shenanigans we don't know, it impacts on service delivery. It's a fact. It's money belongs to the taxpayer, supposed to be implemented. We need to cap that. I have to ask from all present at this event, do we fail to plan or do we plan to fail? Or to, do we go into paralysis of analysis? Like the professor was saying, have you clearly identified the goals that will support the four key objectives as envisaged in NDP? To refresh our collective memories, I recall the objectives to be providing overarching goals for what we want to achieve in 2030. Building consensus on the key obstacles to us. Achieving these goals and what needs to be done to overcome those obstacles. Providing a shared long-term strategic framework within which more detailed planning can take place in order to advance the long-term goals set out in NDP. Long-term strategy. Creating a basis for making choices about how best to use limited resources. Whenever I read the news or engage with other local and international leaders, the message is the same. We are a nation in trouble with little reputational, economic, or political runway left. The global reaction to the ill-timed and ill-considered remarks by the public protector regarding the Reserve Bank illustrated this. The other day, I was speaking to one of the former prime ministers of Guinea Conakry after the coup. He said to me, my brother, he was phoning from Senegal, Dakar, what's wrong? I said, why? He said, there's a terrible stink from the south. And there's a guy I know very well, we all know him, he was a former prime minister of this country, who loved Africa, Komara. You know him. He said to me, he said, fix this thing, you know. And I met another president nearby that state. He said to me, what has happened to that moral voice of South Africa? So when Mandela spoke, he did not speak for South Africa. He spoke for Africa. And the world respected that as all. That was our brand as Africans. So what happened to it? South Africans have become intolerant of each other's color, beliefs, and social standing. When we don't attempt to glorify colonialism, we become racist or tribalist. We are all guilty of this, irrespective of whether we are white or black. I call particularly on politicians not to use race or tribalism as your fallback positions. 
They are both dangerous, very, very dangerous. And Africa can tell you about this. To implement NDP, we need to start in our neighborhoods. We have to start engaging in civil society structures close to our homes and our workplaces to become part of a nation that can work together to solve our collective problems. With our investment status recently downgraded, not only our country rating, but also our large corporate, corporate and institutional businesses, our ability to meet our shared objectives in NDP is under pressure. Hence the questions you were raising earlier on, Peter, and yourself, Prof, implementation. How do we measure that implementation after that so many years? I think that's a subject matter for another day. Maybe we should have a discussion about how far have we implemented the NDP and why have we not implemented so that we can learn from our mistakes and move on. If we think we can implement NDP without performing structural changes in our economy, the foundation of the Freedom Charter, we're mistaken. It is time that we realize that our political actions have far-reaching implications for those that are cold in cold winter. From our kitchens and living rooms through the bedrooms, bedrooms of small and large corp organizations, including those of our neighbors, our actions have a negative impact on everybody in our region. I've already alluded to this. We should start heeding the advice that we get from our local and foreign investors as well as advice from the rating agencies and the very structures we like to avoid, the World Bank and the IMF. You know, Professor Mtambara, there's strange wisdom. We don't share that wisdom as South Africans, that when the rent drops, you can pick it up. It's like Maria Antoinette saying, if there's no cake, eat bread. If there's no bread, eat cake. It's cold. It's uncalculating. It's not showing knowledge. The time has come where we should start implementing reforms such as re-engineering the labor markets to ensure competition and dramatically enhance access to skill, to critically evaluating public sector efficiencies and reducing the size and impact that the cost of public sector wages has on the budgets of the three tiers of our government. We need smaller government to create bigger wealth participation. Putty, when you are the president, cut the cabinet by one, by half. Evaluating all our state-owned enterprises, turning those around that we need to as, as assisting our economy and society to develop and grow, and when necessary, closing the doors of those corrupt institutions that are robbing us of our scarce resources. Fundamentally reform the education and healthcare systems to ensure that we have an educated, healthy labor force aligned with the needs of our economy. You cannot have a productive economy made up of sick people. So our health system must be very good and keep the nation very healthy. The stories we hear in other parts of our own country call for more action to invest not only in education but also in health so that the health conditions of a nation is, is improved all the time. Critically evaluating all expenditure in our national, provincial, and local government budgets. Removing expenditure on times items that are not in the national interest. With our national debt likely in the order of 60% of our annual GDP, if we add local government um, and state enterpri own enterprise debt and guarantees to the national debt, we exceeded the margin number magic number of 40% of the GDP a long time ago. We need a good, strong, and growing economy. A 6% real growth in our annual GDP is not far-fetched, and we must work for that, to allow for foreign direct investment in our economy. To achieve this is restructuring of our economy away from commodities, therefore mining, but must become a priority with our policy makers. We all know that investment and growth in that order goes hand in hand. Why then do the refusal by our own companies to invest and grow locally? Why are our corporations all moving their investments offshore or start best thinking of moving it there? The problem here, Peter, is that money is a coward. If we are not an attractive investment destination, money will find other destinations. We have been beating our chest saying that they were the gateway to Africa. I think it's no longer valid, it's no longer true. There's many African countries who are becoming very competitive 
and of course it's good, it's healthy for the continent. I think it is clear that the regular announcements by ministers and other policymakers changing the rules of the game have significantly negative impact on our economy. Since when has larger shareholder stakes without compensation of its owners advanced the revenue or growth of a company or a country? Destructive and sudden structural policy reforms such as those included in the new mining charter, and I spoke on this a week ago at the mining endeavor, and I'm happy the NC has already spoken on this matter as well, by the Honorable Minister of Mining last week, bring investment, flight, and risk of further economic slowdown in the economy. The consultation which are taking place at the moment with Chamber of Commerce and other uh, stakeholders must continue to find the middle ground and a way forward. The only outcome from what we have now is higher poverty rates and lower economic growth and higher unemployment. South Africans want elected officials, appointed officials, business people and civil to respect our constitution and abide by its principles. For this constitution we fought for, we died for. We must protect it, we must respect it. It remains one of the key guarantees of our democracy today. And you will see as we go along into the future, it will continue to prove so. Officials must start doing their jobs and not rest, test their or resolve in court when they feel like not adhering to the spirit of the Constitution or the principle of it. We cannot say we don't know the Constitution. We wrote it. Why do we want to be told by the courts how to implement it? We should know how to implement it and not waste the time of the court with many, many court actions. There are so many issues to deal with in this country. How do we achieve the South Africa we deserve? Firstly, we deserve political stability and political certainty and dependability and reliability. When I speak to foreign investors, they, con they consistently tell me that political risk is the biggest problem. They also tell me that policy uncertainty and outcome of political turmoil and uncertainty preclude many funds to even consider South Africa in its investment portfolio let alone buying South African stocks to hold. When political parties falling, falling over themselves to be more radical and populist, it is highly unlikely that we will see stronger economic growth and prosperity. To overcome this, we need strong leadership that will place economic growth and social transformation on the same level, not one before the other. We need South Africa to stand together like, they, like, like we have done in 1955, 1994, 2010, during the World Cup, and many other occasions to ensure social stability and inclusive growth. Secondly, we must celebrate and enjoy the freedoms that the Constitution has bestowed upon all of us. However, we must see it in the context of the Freedom Charter and the responsibilities that it has brought to each and every one of us. To me personally, freedom is one of the most sought after ideals in human history. Man's search for freedom has taken him into the fiercest of protest struggles, revolutions, civil wars, even world wars. Today, in the midst of free societies, many continue to fight for what they perceive as ever greater freedoms. Before we get carried away and take note of what the Apostle Peter said about many people who promote freedoms, he said, open quote, the, prom the promise then freedom but they themselves are the slaves of corruption, for people are slaves of whatever masters them." Close quote. If you are overcome by something, you are enslaved to it. Things like corruption, drugs, alcohol, and other aspects of life that ensnares us. To the youth and those interpreting the Freedom Charter for our own gain, I will say, enjoying freedom is never free. Others have paid a price some have been maimed and others have died. Don't demean the, their contribution to your freedom. Be responsible in your actions and build on it. That way you can pay homage to those that came before you, the Mandelas, the Susulus, and the Menis. Freedom comes with great responsibility and many obligations. It's not only about rights, it's also about obligations. All of us must strive to be responsible and adhere to the laws of the country and to make the best of the opportunities available to contribute to society to make it a safe and better place for all. Thirdly, I want to live in a country where I can enjoy the freedoms 
that we have organized, gained since the fall of apartheid and not lose them all over again because of a captured situation. To all our leaders, we deserve that the rule of law be upheld and respected. Corrupt leaders must be held accountable for their actions and exemplary leadership praises, praised when they deliver beyond their calling. Fourthly, our country is in dire need of economic growth. It is only through growth in our economy that we will be able to eradicate our economic and social backlogs and create the environment for, for jobs, job creation and participative economic citizenship. The mishmash of economic, economic policy decisions suiting the few and suffocating the dreams of the majority of South Africans is destroying the fabric of our societies. Black and white are pitted against each other as a result of our policies of wealth to the few and poverty to the rest. Finally, we deserve many other things, and I will list them, MC, like safe conditions where we are not harassed, hijacked, raped, or murdered by criminals or those with political aspirations. A place where our environment is protected and water is used with oversight. Where land ownership and productive land is protected and farmers don't get murdered or farm workers don't get abused. A parliament where decisions are made, not rubber stamped. Of course, we need to ask our parliament to stabilize the situation a bit so we can focus on the big issues facing the nation. A health system that is not in danger of collapsing, hurting the already marginalized. State-owned enterprises that are not used as savings bank by the few at the cost of all of us. And an inclusive quality education system that ensures skills, development in support of our political, social, and economic aspirations. I can carry on, ladies and gentlemen, but I believe mostly what we need is a recovery plan, a serious recovery plan that includes all of what we deserve. We deserve a recovery plan developed and implemented under the watchful eye and guidance of a trusted and virtuous leadership. A plan reflecting the dreams of those that formulated and penned the Freedom Charter. With the focus of this third TOPO summit, the National Development Plan must be strongly advanced as the inclusive, inclusive recovery plan to change South Africa for the better. We have accepted the NDP as the plan, embodying the dreams and desires of the leaders that helped to formulate it in the Freedom Charter, as well as our generation of leaders and our modern society that supported its adoption. Ladies and gentlemen, I am like every other South African and am demanding that if you are found like our president has violated the Constitution, that you have to honor the Constitution and fall on your own sword and leave your positions. I am one of those. And I'm one of those, though not much in the street, but I'm the first one to say the president violated the Constitution and that we could do better without him. We have not seen this level of criminality and greed in the history of South Africa, all in the name of a protected psycho psycho psychopathic family and a government predominantly guided by, as an email shows, a bunch of imported gangsters. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we don't deserve this. South Africa deserves better. We are good people. We are good people, and we cannot close our eyes to what we see or to shut our minds to what we can think about as corruption. Corruption, whether it's with capital C or small c, is corruption. We cannot tolerate it. We deserve change, growth, political stability, and job creation. We deserve leadership in a government that will put people first, not South Africa first, people first. Thank you very much. Vision 2030, the National Development Plan. It's our future. Let's go for it, man.